All right. Welcome, Dr. Caitlin Northey. I'm really happy that you can join us for this episode of the CDCI Connects podcast. For the benefit of our listening audience, I am Dr. Valerie Wood. I am the Research and Evaluation Coordinator at the Center on Disability and Community Inclusion, or CDCI. And my research interest is in systems improvements, and this includes the state child welfare system and the state education system. And I'd also like to mention that this project that we're introducing today was a partnership amongst uh, yourself, myself, and our colleague, Dr. Lori Meyer, who was integral to the project. Unfortunately, uh, she cannot join us today, but she's asked us to proceed and we will do our best to represent the points she is passionate about as well. So with my introduction done, could you please introduce yourself? Sure, so my name is Dr. Caitlin Northey and I am an assistant professor of early childhood at the University of Vermont. And my research really focuses on policy implementation and issues pertaining to the early childhood workforce. Fabulous. So could you briefly describe the Promoting Inclusion and Exploring Supports or PI study? Yes. Well, first, it's important to mention that it was a quality improvement project that was funded by Vermont's Child Development Division using preschool development birth to five grant funding. And I'll add that um, I thought it was really impressive that this project grew out of a recognition on behalf of the Child Development Division and Children's Integrated Services that um, there was an issue related to suspension and expulsion of young children from their early education settings. Um, and I know we're going to define uh, the term early education setting later in our conversation, but the fact of the matter was that the state itself said, um, there's an issue here and we really want to understand what's happening and why it's happening. What are the drivers of these decisions of suspension and expulsion? And then um, we both get really passionate about yeah. perspectives around that. Um, so what was the goal of the project? Our overall goal was really to better understand the supports and services that are available to the young children with specialized health needs in Vermont to understand, you know, what kind of things are here to keep them in school uh, and in their care, early care and learning settings. Um, and we, we also looked to some other states for some advice about what we could do to help improve. That's great. And, you know, when I came into this project, so my background isn't in um, early childhood development or early education. Um, you know, I, I came at this from the perspective of disability rights, disability advocacy, based on my experience at the Center on Disability and Community Inclusion. And um, I had no idea until I partnered with you and Dr. Meyer on this project that uh, there's wide recognition that this is an issue, that kids as young as two and three are being suspended or expelled from these settings, uh, public pre-K settings, private uh, education settings. And, and that in and of itself was a little bit mind boggling to me. Like what could a two or three year old be doing <laughs> that's necessitating that kind of extreme reaction? Right, and we also know that it's an issue within the system because it's not like all children are being suspended and expelled equally. We know that black children, boys, BIPOC children, children with disabilities, there are certain groups of children that experience higher rates of suspension and expulsion than you would expect to see given their percentage of representation in the overall population. So I think, especially since 2016, this has been a really big focus, even at the federal government uh, level. Uh, but it was really wonderful to see a project like this get funded in Vermont so we could figure out what's what's happening here. Yes, and thank you for, you know, really elevating the, the portion about um, disparate impact that some groups are disproportionately being affected by this problem. So um, I do want to pause here to define a couple terms, and I know you want to define a couple terms as well. So um, the first term that I'm going to define is specialized health needs. So in the framing of our report, 
uh, we talked about uh, young children. So uh, we defined young as birth to six. That was the age group that we were focused on, but young children with specialized health needs. And so that's a broad term. Uh, to break it down, it really means that a person, in this case a child, requires more care due to a physical, developmental, behavioral, or emotional difference. So that's a lot. There are these different domains. Um, I think it's important to emphasize there's a lot of diversity under this umbrella term of specialized health needs. And depending on the nature of that specialized health need, the kind of support a child might need in a classroom can look really different. So um, as a concrete example, you know, a child who has autism will probably need different supports than a child who is a wheelchair user. So, um, you know, it's a broad term um, in terms of the scope of what we're looking at under specialized health needs. Another uh, jargony term that we talked about in our report is multi-tiered systems of support. And this will come up in our, one of our recommendations. So multi-tiered systems of support or MTSS as it's abbreviated is a term used in the field of education. It's a framework that helps educators provide academic or behavioral strategies tailored to the needs of students. Um, and one of the things I learned in this project is that the concept of an MTSS framework uh, grew out of the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, IDEA, <clears throat> which was passed by Congress in 2004. Uh, again, the main point that I found fascinating is um, this uh, the passage of that act really became an impetus to encourage teachers and educators to be more proactive in the classroom rather than reactive. So the way I, I heard it um, framed in some what I reviewed is rather than waiting for the child to fail to do anything about it, it's identifying what um, supports the child needs to be successful at the outset. So um, being again, proactive instead of reactive and uh, like a lot of things related to disability, the, what the literature shows is that um, the MPSS framework benefits all students, not just the students with disabilities. Great. And then um, what other terms would you like to define for our listening audience? I wanted to talk about ECE because it's a it's a little acronym that we throw around. Uh, it can mean early care and education. It can mean early childhood education. Uh, the field defines early childhood education and early childhood and early care and education as really being relevant to ages birth to age eight. So obviously, part of that continuum crosses into elementary school, right? So. When we were thinking about this study and really framing it, we really focused on birth to age six, like you said, and we were really looking at the early care and education settings that children were experiencing prior to kindergarten entry. And so that's really diverse. Uh, there, It could be in an early Head Start classroom, a Head Start classroom, a childcare at a center, a family-based childcare. It could be at a public preschool classroom that's based out of an elementary school or a school district. I mean, there are a lot of different settings each with their own regulations and qualifications and those types of things. And so when we think about these children, they're sometimes in multiple settings, right? They're, they're experiencing all different types of interactions with early childhood professionals um, throughout their early lives. And so early childhood education, ECE is a term that might come up um, or when we refer to early childhood, know that for this study, we were really thinking about birth to age six. Great, thank you, that's so helpful. Um, so the goal of the study was to really investigate what's happening with young children ages zero to six in these ECE settings related to suspension and expulsion with a focus on children with specialized health needs. So how did we, uh, you know, so in partnership with Child Development Division and Children Integrated Services, how did we go about answering these questions for our study? Well, I think the first thing uh, that we started thinking about was what do we know more broadly, right? Which is actually a part that you oversaw was really thinking about the literature, what's out there. Uh, what do we already know? What themes uh, have been shown to be important? And we 
then started thinking about, okay, who in the state would be our key informants? So we identified state leaders uh, who had different areas of oversight related to ECE settings in Vermont and other early child professionals, such as providers in Vermont. Um, and we also talked to early childhood state leaders and kind of program coordinators in two other states in Arkansas and Colorado to, to see what are they doing? What's working well for them? What have they learned? Because they were really tackling this as a problem a bit earlier than we were. So Dr. Northy, could you say a little bit more about how you landed on Arkansas and Colorado as two other states that you wanted to look to? Yeah, absolutely. So we had reviewed uh, some of the literature uh, about what are states doing, right? What's going well? What states are kind of being recognized for their efforts? And because we were interested in looking at this from a state level, there had been other programs that might be city-led programs or regional programs that were also getting kudos, as you'd say. Uh, but these two kind of rose to the forefront. And it's important to note that not every state is perfect. But in terms of what we were interested in learning, uh, they really offered great suggestions and opportunities for us to learn more about their practices. That's great. Thank you for sharing a little bit about the thinking behind that. Um, you had mentioned that we conducted a literature review. I'll just talk a little bit about that piece. Um, the literature review, what, you know, when you're looking at doing research, that's almost the natural starting place. But um, for me, as the person that kind of led the effort on the literature review, um, it was always in the forefront of my mind that we wanted to ground any recommendations we made to the state of Vermont in the literature to make sure our recommendations were in line with best practices. Um, you know, again, going back to the idea that this was a quality improvement study, so it had a really specific purpose to, you know, inform um, systems in Vermont in terms of how they can better meet the needs of children and families with special health needs that are seeking out um, an early education setting for their child. So, um, you know, that was one of the reasons to do a fairly thorough literature review. Um, and then the other piece that I took the lead on was um, I interviewed parents of children with special health needs who had sought out um, early education settings for their child. And uh, we'll talk a little bit later about um, the timing of the study, but uh, in addition to offering the option to be interviewed, because you know, parents in general, everybody's busy, but you know, you know, parents are busy. Um, it turned it worked better to offer a dual option for the collection for that population to say, um, you can participate in an interview or you can participate in an online survey. And so the bulk of the data that we collected from the parent or family perspective was um, through the survey results. I think that piece was really important because there are some studies that look at how states are functioning and they just look at the state level. And I think what we were really doing is we were looking at it from the state throughout these different levels, right? From the provider who's actually overseeing a center to thinking about, well, how are families experiencing this, right? And so when we talk about wanting well-coordinated early childhood systems, we want them to work for families, children, and educators. And so getting the perspectives of the people that are on the ground being impacted by these suspensions and expulsions of their children was an absolute key and strength to this work. So I applaud all of your efforts that you managed to get those perspectives. Well, thank you. Yeah, and that's one of the things I'm really passionate about about this project is um, the fact that uh, we looked at this issue from like a multifaceted perspective, right? So you got to talk to providers and got so much insight into um, what's going on with providers because this isn't an easy decision for anyone. Right. It, not for the, the parents on the receiving end, not for the providers who are the ones that uh, need to make those decisions, um, recognition from state leaders that there's an issue. So um, I appreciated that, you know, everyone had a shared recognition that this is a problem, but then their identification of what are the drivers of the problem and where do we um, have like kind of overlap in thinking there. Um, 
Great. So I think we've already started to touch on this, but um, I would love to move into your thoughts about why was this work important to you? Well, I look at policy implementation. I think a lot about the impacts that policies have, and I want to understand the nuances of how they're experienced, right? So I want to know, okay, you have a policy, how does it work for people? You know, what is what is the who, what, where, why, when, and how of how it's actually experienced? Because I think even well-intentioned policies can end up having unintended consequences at, that are felt really significantly by educators and parents and children. And so thinking about any policy that we pass I get really excited to see how is it working? Who, what decisions are being made? How does it trickle down into being implemented? And, you know, just learning more about it. And so this was a great example of, okay, something is happening in classrooms and settings for young children uh, across the country, but even in, here in Vermont, how do we learn more about it? What do we know? And how can we then design policies to keep children in safer? to better support them, to give teachers what they need. Uh, so I was really passionate coming into this about what can this tell us about the system and about policies? How about you? Yeah, so um, I think some of the passions that uh, drove me why we were working on this project was um, we knew there was a child care crisis in Vermont. Um, there's been recognition of that for some time actually and then um, layer on top of that, um, the perspective of uh, parents of a child with a special health need, of which I am one, so I can relate to this issue. Um, and this idea that um, there's a child care crisis and then finding providers that both are knowledgeable and have the comfort to care for your child, it restricts your options even further. And I would argue, like, I live in Chittenden County. So I live in a county that um, most people would say is fairly well resourced in this regard. And I still encountered that challenge. And then um, when we were conducting the study, uh, we had the pandemic, right? And so lots of child care centers either like temporarily went on hiatus or many permanently closed. Um, and so it, you know, it's a child care desert in the way that people talk about food deserts, right? Um, and fun fact, uh, I actually found a website that you can go to to see if like the area that you live is in fact a child care desert. Um, so I really wanted to understand for families that have taken that step of finding a provider that can care for their child while, you know, they're either working or attending to, you know, their other life needs. Um, and then your child is suspended or expelled. And I want to recognize a lot of parents go through this um, experience and they never hear those words. And I'll talk about that a little more later in our discussion. But they're not labeling these experiences as suspension and expulsion. But uh, you know, you get to a point where you know there's recognition your child isn't going to be able to stay in their early uh, care setting. Um, you know, it's just it it becomes so much to manage to then find another one. Um, you know, when you have all these limiting factors. So I really, I really wanted to help the state uh, because I think this is a systems problem. So it requires a systems solution. And I heard some of that language echoed in a, a recent uh, webinar put on by Building Bright Futures, which I know um, is one of our kind of uh, allies uh, in this work. Um, you know, so how can we help the state uh, create a systems level solution for this problem? So can you, you mentioned a child care crisis a few times. So when you say it, you're talking not only about a shortage of actually centers or places for children to go, like the settings themselves, or a spot for a child to actually be enrolled. We also have a child care crisis in terms of staffing, right? So a center might have the space, but they don't have an educator to actually staff the room. Was there anything else you meant by child care crisis? 
I think those two pieces cover it. I think on the ground from the, the family perspective, it's like, can I even find a center that, you know, has the capacity to take my child into a classroom, right? And knowing that there are different staffing ratios depending on the age of children. So younger children, you want there to be lower staffing ratios for younger children compared to somewhat, you know, older children that are maybe getting ready to move into kindergarten in the next year. Um, and yeah, and thank you for raising the other piece, which is uh, the workforce. I know that's, you know, the piece that you're really passionate about um, along with policy. And so um, how are we preparing uh, the workforce in order to meet the needs that families have, right? It's like we're, we're we need more support to do both of those things. Yeah, and I think when you said that um, when we bring specialized health needs into the equation, all of a sudden it gets a lot more difficult because not every setting might be able to meet a child's needs or their learning needs. And I think that was something that I came to better understand through this study and this work. I didn't realize the extent of that and how hard, I mean, I knew it would be difficult for parents, but I, I just can't imagine the additional stress that it puts on families. So. Thank you for, for naming that. I think there is um, an added stressor there that families are certainly are carrying around. Um, so that's, that's kind of the context of our study. So what did we learn? We learned a lot because we gathered a lot of data and I think we had the wonderful but difficult task of really piecing it together because when you're trying to understand an early childhood system, it's really complicated because there are these different settings sometimes, you know, which are overseen by different state agencies and, and divisions. And so thinking about all of these kind of services together and really focusing on children as the center of like, what does this mean for children uh, really helped us. And I think when we were looking across the data, some themes definitely emerged. So the first one I would say is really informed by uh, a lot of the interviews that we did from uh, Arkansas and Colorado as well, right? So some of their strategies that help them minimize and reduce suspension and expulsion actually came down to working together, to actually collaborating and learning about each other's part of this early childhood system. And so it's really inspiring and it also makes it seem like making change is more achievable. Because when we have state leaders who, again, are responsible for their kind of segment of the system, they understand what's happening in centers and, you know, public pre-K classrooms or family child care. Uh, they understand what's happening for these children and the families and the, the coaches or the regional supports that are in place. And so when they understand how their work gets implemented, they're also aware of the political and policy context that come with their work. When we get them to work together at the state level, all of a sudden we have kind of all the keys we need to open the doors. If we can get that collaboration happening in a way that it's streamlined, well-coordinated systems for families and children and early childhood professionals, all of a sudden things are working a lot better. So I would say collaboration was actually one of our really key takeaways is that it's something kind of simple that can actually strengthen and improve early childhood systems across these different levels and across these different agencies. Uh, I would also then say, obviously, my passion for supporting the early childhood workforce is very well known already on this uh, podcast. And so I would say the other biggest takeaway that I had was that it all comes down to the the well-being of the early childhood workforce. I think consistently hearing and reminding people that it is the adults that choose to suspend or expel children. It is the adults that feel overwhelmed or too stressed or you know too unsupported and under-resourced to actually support children and their families. I think that was a really big takeaway for me because we can often say, well, what is this? What is this? 18 month old doing that is so egregious that they need to get sent home. And it, it, it might not be so egregious, right? So thinking about the well-being of the workforce, and we know that 
there, the early childhood workforce is notoriously undercompensated, right? So when we think about not getting paid enough, the stresses that go along with that, I personally left working in the K-12 system to work in early childhood and the pay cut that came with that meant that I had to work a part-time job, you know, thinking about these early childhood educators as doing their best in the moment, but also recognizing that not paying them well means that their lives are pretty stressful and they might not be able to support children with the calm patience and compassion that is always needed to kind of get them through those really tough moments. Katie, I think you're raising a really important point here about the well-being of the workforce. And just, I tell my own kids all the time, teachers are people too. And so it's really important to remember that, you know, we don't understand the entire scope of their lives. We get these small like windows into their day through our children's experiences and then our own experiences with them. And um, you're just raising a really important issue. And I know that during the study, as part of the interviews you conducted, um, a really illuminating story was shared with you. And I was wondering if you could share it with our audience. Yeah, so it was actually from one of the states uh, outside of Vermont that I had spoken to. And someone had, she was in charge of kind of a a program where they went in to support teachers and helping, um, you know, implement positive behavior supports for children. And she had gone into the center director's office and she, you know, was just saying goodbye. Thanks for a great week. I hope you have a great weekend. And she saw this camping equipment and she said, you know, oh, are you going camping? And she said, oh no, it's for some of the teachers. They actually don't always have reliable places to live. And I think just, you know, that coach had said it, but I feel it so deeply, like how can you support the social and emotional development of young children when your own well-being and, and life is, is fraught, is stressful, is insecure? And I think our early childhood educators in Vermont do an exceptional job they have carried families and children through this pandemic. They have carried our teachers in our teacher prep programs, supported them, mentored them. I mean, these individuals are working so incredibly hard. They are well qualified for their positions and they know children, they're doing their best. Teachers deserve to be well compensated. And so that means, you know, fairly compensated for their work and also receiving benefits. I think it's really interesting and problematic that when COVID hit, the COVID-19 pandemic started, higher ed closed, K through 12 closed, and early childhood centers closed for a little bit, but then they really soon opened back up. And these were some of the educators in our overall education system that are the lowest compensated and the most likely to lack health benefits. And so thinking about what position that puts those educators in is really tricky. I also just want to go back to when we think about teacher well-being, which is again supported by the research, right? We know that stressed out teachers, teachers that have too many children in a classroom, teachers that are um, experiencing things in their personal lives, we know that they have, they're not as able to impact kind of children's learning and development in the positive ways that they, we want them to be. The research supports this, and especially when it comes to suspension and expulsion. There is a direct correlation between teacher well-being and the rates of suspension and expulsion that we see for young children. So when I want to think about these teachers as well, I also want to say they need to be well qualified. They need to have the training and education to support the children that are in their care. And I think this has come up for us a few times in this conversation of this idea of supporting all children, right? Children with specialized health needs might have specific needs. Are the typical early childhood teacher preparation programs preparing those teachers for that? Possibly, but they might also need some ongoing professional support, right? So some access to additional training and the research suggests that if that training can do with meeting children's specialized needs or and I should say, and um, the social and emotional development of children that will lower the rates of suspension and expulsion that we see for young children. So it's really fascinating. I think 
I obviously come into this project thinking about the workforce and thinking about policy, but I was really struck by how many of our kind of recommendations really focus and involve educators at the center and thinking about the interpersonal dynamics at the state level, right? So that collaboration, the well-being of the workforce, I would, I'm going to hog the floor while I have it and say that another one of our recommendations focused on a data system. So having a data system where multiple entities can contribute, can access that data, obviously in safe and protected ways for children, um, is really key to first of all, understanding the suspension and expulsion that's occurring and into kind of bringing all of our early childhood settings into one space uh, where they can all meet children's needs because a lot of children intersect with different aspects of this system, right? It is not unusual because of our state uh, UPK system, which offers 10 hours of universal pre-kindergarten uh, a week that a child going to UPK will also go to kind of wraparound care at another center or setting and maybe another, right? So already you have a child who might be present in, in multiple systems. And so having a data system in place that where all of their information and the supports they're receiving and past issues that they've had can really come together would be really helpful. And I will just say that, um, Building Bright Futures has been working really hard as kind of a leader on this effort. And so uh, they actually just released a policy brief or a data brief uh, this past March, I think, uh, which we can link to, uh, but it's really impressive how much they've already moved this work forward just since our report was published in March of 2021. And it's been an ongoing issue in Vermont. So it was really exciting. I mean, okay, so thinking about the report, what else did we learn, Valerie? Because I have so, yeah, yeah, no, all that information, it's it's so great to um, hear from your perspective and, and the analogy, right, that came to mind when you were talking about um, the workforce and making sure that we're caring for the workforce so that they're well prepared to care for our children, right? It's um, as a parent, I've heard this so many times, you know, when you're flying on the plane, put your own oxygen mask on first because you can't care for others if you're not taking care of yourself, right? And so I think that's really applicable in this scenario. Right? What are we asking of our teachers? And if we're asking so much of them, are we equipping them with, you know, the things they need to feel well supported? So, you know, you talked about, you know, looking at salary, looking at benefits, but also looking at professional development opportunities. I think that's all really important. Um, a couple other lessons that we learned and recommendations that we put forth were um, thinking about policies that are inclusion centered. So at the top of our conversation, I mentioned um, IDEA, which is the, the policy that, you know, protects the rights of children with disabilities to get an education. But like so many things, it was an add-on, right? There was already a public education system. And then, you know, there had to be this push to say, well, we need to make sure that the rights of people with disabilities are protected and that they're having the same access to a free and appropriate education. Um, and so, right, I, I, in so many conversations about diversity, equity, inclusion, this, there's this idea of like, flipping the script around to say, instead of thinking about um, equity as an add-on, equity needs to be at the center, right? And so this case, we're centering equity for children with specialized health needs and their families that love and support them. And so, you know, what, what would it look like for Vermont to really take a stance to say, when it comes to early education settings, that's inclusion centered. And so, you know, when I interviewed some of the parents, um, some of them, you know, either in the interviews or in the survey data that I've reviewed, you know, mentioned that they didn't even pursue childcare or, um, you know, an early education setting for their child uh, because they had no confidence that there were any providers in their community that could meet the needs of their child. And so 
I think about that. I think about, so what are we asking of the parents in that situation, right? Are they, you know, sacrificing their desire to work? Um, that means the family is bringing in less income. Like there's real ramifications when families have to choose between working or staying at home for their child. And, um, you know, Again, I want to recognize diversity of all families. For some families, having a stay-at-home parent is the right choice. And, you know, those families should be celebrated. And it should be a choice, right? If somebody wants to work, they should be able to figure out within the early childhood system how that can work for their family. And so, you know, I think about... Um, I think the inclusion-centered piece actually dovetails with what you're talking about professional development, right? So we might need a lot more professional development opportunities for providers to understand how do you work with a child that uses a feeding tube, right? How do you work to set up your center so that you know it is 100% wheel wheelchair accessible, right? And knowing that some of these places, you know the size of the classroom, you know, that's your footprint. And then so square footage, you're paying taxes, like there are financial repercussions to say, you know, space the tables out, that means fewer children can fit, but you're also, you're doing the right thing to say, we value inclusion and we value all students. So I get really excited when I think about the possibility there for um, policies that are inclusion centered and that meet the needs of all children seeking care. I think it's so important though that you're saying we need these policies that are inclusion centered and we need the support so they can be implemented, right? We need the extra funding so we can say, hey, we have to make a shift in the physical you know, space that we're in. We need uh, maybe a nurse to come in to help us for a bit. Like we, we need all of those things, right? We need the policies and we need the supports in place that, to have a broader infrastructure to actually make sure that we can offer that support. Absolutely, like, please, no unfunded mandates. <laughs> like, it's one thing to pass the policy, but if you don't put any teeth behind it, if you don't put the financial support behind it, then the burden just either, it falls on the providers or, and in a lot of cases, then the, the story is then that burden gets passed on to the families, right? So yeah, it does, it's a systems level problem that needs a systems level solution. Yeah. Um, another thing that we learned, and I want to make sure to give credit to Dr. Lori Meyer here, because this was a piece that um, she really led the investigation uh, um, that led to this particular recommendation, but um, conducting additional research on the use of one-on-ones as a support strategy in Vermont's um, early care and education system. Um, and I remember her saying at a presentation that we did together that not all children need a one-on-one, -on -one, but if our system is missing the less intensive support, so those mid-level supports, then one-on-ones become a catch-all. Uh, Source to support children. So, you know, really thinking about um, when that's the only support that's available to you, how many people are going to gravitate, grab, and, and I heard this from parents. They're like, well, you know, we were able to access special funding to get our kid a one-on-one -on -one support, um, and that was the solution that allowed our child to, um, the, the term we would use in, from child welfare is to have placement stability within their early education setting, I think it's a term that really applies here, right? Because um, changing schools is a kind of like instability that adds to stress for the child. Um, and it's a loss of funding for the providers. Like there's so many impacts when a child is suspended or expelled, asked to, to leave a center. Um, but really, um, she was very passionate about this recommendation of saying, um, you know, a lot of children are accessing one-on-ones that probably could be supported with a less intensive. So could that be a two-on-one or is that having um, a lower 
teacher to student ratio in classrooms which you reference as part of teacher well-being exactly i um since we've done this report i've had quite a few conversations with people uh about it and i recently was talking to a child care center director who was trying to estimate you know the, the costs involved um with really making safe spaces for children uh and she said you know i've never suspended or expelled a child but that might mean that a child has to be in a classroom with fewer children. They, you know, which are spots that she's not able to fill. It might mean that she has to hire someone else to go in as a, an extra part-time teacher and support. So I think it's important to also name that center directors and, and leaders of these settings are already trying to use their own resources as well to solve these problems. But I mean, it's just so difficult. Um, so yeah, more stories are needed to help us really inform the legislature about like, how do we do this? How can we make this better? Absolutely. Um, another one of the recommendations that grew out of Lori's work on our project was investigating and investing in an early multi-tiered system of support. So I had defined that term at the beginning. Um, and so, uh, Vermont already supports the implementation of multi-tiered systems of support in K-12 schools. So this would just really be broadening the scope of what they support to say, we're also going to include these early education settings in um, the policy that supports MTSS systems. Um, so the model that um, I am most familiar with that falls under the umbrella term of multi-tiered system supports is positive behavior interventions and supports or PBIS. Um, and so we, we have expertise already in the, in the state of Vermont around implementing PBIS. Um, and so what could that look like to say, we're also going to include these other settings as a way to help prevent, um, you know, our, our outcome was preventing suspension and expulsion, but really, uh, you know, as someone who has worked with the team that implements PBS in our state, um, it's really looking at the holistic health of our student population. And it's really interesting. This project really helped me understand that, like, schools are a unique community. And so why are we excluding early childhood education systems from that, right? And so really starting to say, it's a continuum of your educational experiences from birth to really like, you know, from beginning to yeah. end, like ideally I'm an academic, learning never ends. Um, that's not everyone's experience, um, but really I don't, I, I think the state of Vermont should consider what that would look like in terms of folding in these other settings into best practices that we know support students. Yeah, in early childhood, we often talk about like a continuum of learning, right, which it, it means building a kind of horizontal uh, alignment, right, between, you know, Head Start, public preschool, and, you know, preschool, and it also means that vertical alignment. So everything that's happening from infants, you know, from that early Head Start uh, experience is going to impact what's happening later. So how do we align things? How, how do we get our standards in order for, you know, learning and how do we get our policies in order, transitions, you know, all of these things that it might seem from one perspective that they are just different systems, but in reality and how children and families experience them and educators in many instances, they are one system all together, ideally, right? Like we really want to think about these things as being interconnected and honor that interconnection. Absolutely. And then the final recommendation that we put into our report to the state of Vermont, in which we've kind of showcased at some of the presentations that we've done together as a research team, is creating policies for warm handoffs when families are asked to change child care providers. And all right, I'm going to just be really honest uh, with you and our listening audience and say, I really hesitated. So that's a recommendation that grew out of um, the parent interviews and survey data that uh, I collected as part of the project. And I really hesitated to put that in there because really, if we are being inclusion centered, suspension exposure will never happen. Uh, you know, uh, families are not asked to change child care providers. It's really 
having a conversation with the family to say, this is, this is what's happening in the classroom. This is what we're observing in your son or daughter. And, you know, we want to make a plan with you to figure out what additional supports are needed. Um, so it's very idealistic. Right. And we've talked about, you know, obviously some of the challenges around that. Um, is it really fair to, uh, you know, ask providers to do even more given some of the stressors that we've talked about? Um, but, you know, knowing that at least for now, suspension and expulsion may still happen because those options are completely eliminated, um, at least saying to the family, we understand this is really hard to hear, that we are not in a position to adequately support your child at this time. But here is someone from, you know, is it Children's Integrated Services? Is it, you know, Child Development Division? Like, there are experts out there that can be invited into those conversations to help the family locate other options to say, here's a provider who has experience working with this, or there are no providers that have this, this expertise, but we're going to, you know, provide professional development training and this person's willing to take that on. So, you know, um, in the report, I said, you know, um, no family should be left out in the cold, right? Because that's what it feels like. Like, we can't care for your child. Goodbye. Like, suddenly, you know, you're not the quote problem for that child care, but as a family, you're just left struggling to figure out what do we do next? And it's, it's really hard. Yeah, absolutely. I'm glad you included it. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, I really was on the fence about it. Um, so those were, you know, some of our lessons that we learned, um, some of the recommendations we made to the state, um, there are also challenges when we were conducting this study. So what would you like to share? Oh, well, let's go back to January, 2021. What challenges could there possibly have been? I would obviously say that the pandemic presented one of the biggest challenges. I think when you're designing a study, you are thinking about um, all the different things that could happen, but I think I really think that it it presented some challenges for us in terms of the time that other people had to give to us, uh, the the bandwidth they had to like do one extra thing, right? So I think that we can't ignore the the fact that this data was gathered during COVID, um, and and in a very short time frame, right? I mean, yeah, we had three months. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we started in January and our report was due at the end of March. So, and then we can't just gather the data and then write a report. You have to analyze that data. So it was a very quick paced and uh, maybe grueling uh, experience, um, but a valuable one. That was a challenge for sure. And, you know, I'm really amazed at the, the depth of what we were able to learn, right? And I really appreciate, you know, I think that speaks to the teamwork that existed between the three of us to, you know, highlight, you know, what can happen when people are collaborating. So we came into this project with like clear areas of both expertise and passion. And, you know, from the outset, it was very clear, you know, the pieces that uh, Lori wanted to take the lead on, that you wanted to take the lead on, that I wanted to take the lead on. And so we were able to just um, synergize our efforts in this really beautiful way that um, I think, you know, continues to um, feed into some of the discussions we're hearing at the state level. Uh, the state is really grappling right now. Where do they go next with the concept of supporting um, young children and early childhood education? Um, you know, and I know that uh, Building Bright Futures uh, was um, hosting a webinar yesterday, actually, where they had a, a independent research group. I forget their name, uh, but they. Uh, looked at a governance study, right, to say what recommendations would they have and, you know, should it all be consolidated under agency of education? Should it all be consolidated under agency of human services? Should something new 
be created. And I won't, I won't speak to their recommendations because that's a little bit beyond the focus of our conversation today. But I do think it's fascinating that I see this as like, this was like a first step in the state really grappling with this question, or maybe not the first step. I think they've been grappling with it for some time. We were able to provide additional insight both based on research literature and you know, the lived experiences of providers in Vermont, of parents in Vermont about, you know, um, some of the pains that are experienced with the way the system's currently structured. And, and the system structure as an issue has been well acknowledged. That study that you're referencing, um, the early childhood systems analysis was actually paid for. Like the, the Vermont legislature passed it last year as part of H-171, now Act 45, uh, recognizing that if we want to improve our early childhood system, we need to improve that structure at the state level. And so I think it goes back to our finding about collaboration. I do think that when you have early childhood living in so many different sectors uh, of the state, um, it makes data collection a little extra challenging. We were constantly concerned that we were missing a perspective, right? Uh, we would be in an interview and someone would say, oh, well, did you talk to this person? And we're like, no, yes, let's talk to that person. I mean, it just, you know, when we think about like efficiency as part of effectiveness, like it is very spread out right now. And so I think uh, hopefully the, the legislature will reflect on that study. Uh, but I will say that it, it, it made some challenges for data collection and analysis for sure, because I think it made us worry that we weren't getting a full picture. And so we ended up doing a lot more interviews than we probably initially thought we would. Yeah, I remember in our team meetings, you and Lori just um, sharing with me when we have our research huddles, like, well, so now we have three more people that we need to interview. And like, really, like as a research team, uh, the three of us feeling like, to do justice to this work, we can't exclude these different perspectives. So even like inclusion of voice was a guiding principle of the way in which we conducted this study together. Yeah, and I obviously I'm very interested in state governance structures. It's like a nerd moment for me. I really love it. I love thinking about the implications of it. Love thinking about how to improve it. Uh, I love thinking about all the things, uh, but it was so, fascinating and frustrating uh, to be having that experience in our own state. And then when I'm trying to organize data collection in an, another state, they're saying, oh, sure. Do you want to talk to all the leaders that interface with this? We all meet once a week. You can come to our meeting. We meet for two hours and being like, wait, you're all there together in what? And so I think just that collaboration aspect, thinking about how people are coming together, thinking about how they're organized. Um, yeah. I think that's a great lead in to our next question, which is what do you see as the real world impact of this study? Well, okay, wait, before we, before we get to that, I do, I want to say a little bit more about the context because I think we mentioned timing as a challenge. You mentioned COVID as a challenge, but with that also, we, we were in this very rich moment in time where early childhood was really recognized as a profession that is important, not just for the well-being of children and their future, you know, positive outcomes in life and, you know, benefits for society, but also a benefit for parents and families. Uh, and I, I think for our overall economy, like we were in this really pivotal moment asking questions about early childhood when actually people were listening and wanting to invest and improve. And our, there's been a trend in the United States uh, and internationally to really think about a shift in how we define the purposes of early childhood systems, right? So I think there was this focus on equality for a really long time. Like, how do we get people access? We want all people to have access. We want all the children to have access. And that's where you get some debates in the field about targeted versus universal, where, is, where are things being offered? There's been a shift in the past few years to really think about the equity of an early childhood system. And so not just about quantity and, and quality, but also can that system meet 
children's diverse needs? Can it provide for children? Can it actually support children in the ways they need to be supported? And so our project came at a time when there are resources behind these efforts, there are there's a desire for change. And so I, I think if we're gonna name the challenges, I also wanna just say like, wow, what a moment. Uh, it, it was incredibly impactful and, and powerful, which gets me to your question about impact and thinking about sometimes you work really hard and you write a research report and you submit it and maybe someone you love and care about reads it right? Maybe they don't even read it all the way through. Uh, but this moment in time that we found ourselves, we had people emailing us for this report. We, you know, when is it coming out? What are you finding? Okay. If you can't send me the report, like, can you talk to me? Uh, there's an interest in getting some improvement effort off the ground, right? We want to stop this problem. Head Start is kind of ahead of us because federally, uh, you know, Head Start has said you cannot suspend or expel children from a Head Start program. You have to document all the sports you're giving them. We'll give you resources. And so again, thinking about the multiple systems that children uh, experience and whether they're equitable, we want all children to have access to that, right? And so I would say that one of the first ways that I felt we were having an impact was the conversations that we had with advocates. We were invited to meetings, lots of meetings. We were invited to um, talk to people about, what do we do with this? We read your report, we love it, we read your recommendations, what do they mean? Um, and, and that was really powerful for me because I think it's something that maybe didn't get a lot of attention. And so last spring, uh, actually, you know, our report, I think it wasn't made public until maybe May of 2021. Um, because there was some turnover at the state, I think. Uh, but the Vermont legislature passed Act 35, which said you cannot expel or suspend young children, zero to age eight, from a public setting. Well, we use a mixed delivery approach to early childhood. And so what is public? What is, you know, like, so you might be a, a child in a private, child care center, uh, but you get 10 free hours of public pre-K a week. And so thinking about the limitations of that policy, again, while well-intentioned, it left a lot of holes. It left a lot of uncertainties. It left questions, uh, some of the basic ones being like, how are we defining suspension and expulsion? What does that mean for an infant? What does it mean for a toddler? What does it mean in a family child care setting uh, versus a public pre-K and an elementary setting. Uh, so I think our work raised a lot of questions and it raised a lot of um, really valid points and conversations to the point where this past legislative section, uh, they expanded that law and they said that it is now not okay to suspend or expel children uh, from public or private pre-qualified programs. And Building Bright Futures is going to work with the Agency of Ed and the Child Development Division to really think about not only defining these terms, but really coming up with explicit examples of what they look like in these spaces. Because I think you're right, something you said earlier at the top of this is families don't always know that their child is yeah. being suspended or expelled, right? Uh, and you could probably speak to that more than I could, but I, I do know even when I was a teacher in a child care center, you know, a, a parent might get a call saying, oh, your child can't get through their day. Can you come pick them yes, up? And it's exactly like that is pretty much a suspension unless they have kind of like a fever or something going on. And so thinking about, okay, naming what these things are. And so I think our work has had an impact, but it's also benefited, benefited from being in this moment in time, it nationally and in our state. And I I'm really curious to see how the momentum of this moment moves forward because we have a lot of efforts right now in Vermont to advance early childhood as a profession, to talk about having a workforce that is well qualified, well compensated, and, and why that is so important. And that directly intersects with what we're talking about in this report, right? And so if we're going to pass a policy that says and update it to say you can't suspend or expel children, well, great. Research tells us that teacher well-being is key to that. Teacher compensation, key to that. Teacher preparation and knowledge, key to that. So we can't really do one thing without really fixing that system as a whole. And so 
I think we've had an impact and I'm excited to see it continue to have a, an impact in those ripple effects. How about you? Yeah, thank you for sharing. Uh, I want to go back to the, the piece about um, defining the term suspension and expulsion because so that was kind of how we oriented our goal of this research project was to understand um, and provide requisitions to the state uh, around suspension and expulsion of young children to per ultimately eliminate, but at least to prevent it, right? And so, um, and in my both literature review and then in um, conversations with parents that are sharing, you know, their you know, very personal experiences of um, their child being suspended expelled, you know, the majority of them told me or, or wrote in their survey information, uh, nobody ever used the term suspended or expelled. So there's actually a term for that in the literature. It's called a soft suspension. And so what that looks like, right? So, right, context setting. Most of these families are enrolling their child in an EC setting because of work considerations, right? Uh, but then you're getting call. Little Johnny did this or little Janie did that, right? And like you said, they uh, are having trouble uh, getting through the day. They're having trouble maybe self-regulating. We need you to come pick up little, you know, little Johnny or little Janie. Um, and then, you know, you get a call again two days later and you get a call again the next day. And it just becomes this pattern where as the parent, you can no longer rely on your child making it through the day. And so when it starts to be disruptive to your ability to fulfill your other responsibilities, whether they're work-related or again, you know, other life considerations, um, that's when actually, so most of these conversations around soft suspension is um, the parent just recognizing this, this particular center or this particular setting, they can't meet my child's needs, I'm withdrawing them from care. And so it feels, feels like this gray area that the state's really going to have to grapple with because on the one hand, the parent isn't being asked to remove the child, but you all, and as someone who went through this, you get the sense that it's going to happen. And it's, it's in some ways less painful for you as the parent to be the decider and the agent of change than almost giving that power to someone else to say, right? Um, so there, there's, there's power dynamics there. And who has agency to make those decisions, the parent or the provider, um, the child's kind of caught in the middle. Yeah. Um, I, I want to add on to that a little bit. It's just thinking about, not just that, I think it's important that you name those power dynamics, but also just, I imagine as a parent, you want to drop your child off at a place that can meet their needs and where you feel they're safe. And they're not just safe, but maybe having a great experience and developing friendships and meaningful relationships with adults and children and, and learning about the world. And you might not feel safe doing that, or you might feel like your child is misunderstood um, or not valued to the same extent. Yes, thank you for naming that. Um, and there definitely was uh, some parents who shared some of that emotionality in their stories with me as part of the project as well. Um, and then we were talking a little bit of under challenges, right? The pandemic and um, that being part of kind of, you know, the, the temporal context for this along with, it is a very exciting time in Vermont as Vermont's kind of asking these questions about where do they situate um, early childhood education within their state governance system. Um, and I just, I, I wanna recognize that, you know, when schools, uh, when the, the K to 12 system went virtual in Vermont, and you're absolutely right, like many um, early childhood education settings temporarily shut down, but I was one of those parents that was like, what am I supposed to do? And my kids are not, you know, they're all in the public education system now, but, you know, I just, I felt 
like the the angst of you know parents of young children so much and i understood those unfair pressures to our early childhood educators and providers to reopen right um, but you know as a working parent it was like how am i supposed to get my work done and be all the things be parent be teacher be special education teacher be an occupational therapist. I'm going to name all the things, the physical therapist, the speech language pathologist, the um, behavior analyst, the therapist. And then, oh, wait, what if somebody in your family actually gets COVID? On top, like it, it, the pressure, right, that everybody was feeling, but here we're centering the experiences of parents with young children with special health needs. And, you know, Children with special health needs, many of them have an underlying condition so that, you know, the risk of getting COVID is scary in a different way than people that do not have an underlying health condition. Um, so all of this, right, this is all of the like the social milieu of what was happening at the time of our study. Um, so... You know, when I think about the real world impacts, I think all of these thoughts lead into, um, I, I am grateful that the state of Vermont is paying attention, um, not just to this issue of suspension and expulsion, but early childhood education more globally, and really trying to figure out um, what is going to be a better system that, and by better, I mean that better meets the needs. Of uh, Vermonters, uh, you know, of all Vermonters that um, are seeking, you know, to place their child in a safe, fulfilling, nurturing early childhood education system. Um, so yes, it is a really exciting time for the state to be grappling with this question. Um, so we had talked a little bit, one part of this study was looking at how other states are addressing this issue. And so Obviously, some of our learnings and recommendations to the state of Vermont drew from these other states, Colorado and Arkansas. You know, thinking about that, um, is there anything else that, you know, why you have everybody's attention on the podcast? What could Vermont be doing differently? Uh, well, I, I think our recommendations are really strong. I think they reflect a lot of our findings uh, from the data we collected. I think what impressed me about Arkansas and Colorado, just as from a philosophical perspective, was that both, both adopted these adult change models, right? Where they recognized that adults were the people that were choosing to suspend or expel a child. And so they recognized that the adults were actually kind of the lever of change and that could make a difference in the children's lives. So what they did is they invested in supporting those adults. Uh, and so they invested resources and supports for educators and families, right? Like making early childhood mental health consultants more available, having them um, work with teachers uh, for their own kind of needs as well, uh, recognizing that that teacher well-being is part of how all children in the, the classroom are going to experience their learning opportunities. And it just, it, it again reinforces why it's so important to have a well-qualified and well-compensated workforce, but also well-supported and well-resourced one, right? Like we need an early childhood system that is well-resourced. We need to know that there are supports available for children that do need them or families that need them. And I think uh, just what they were doing in terms of of their focus of um, focusing on the adults really reflected what we had seen in the research about, you know, educator stress being related to higher rates of suspension and expulsion. And I, I, I it just was very powerful uh, in thinking about we invest in early childhood opportunities kind of as a country and as states because we want these positive long-term outcomes for individuals, for families, for society. Uh, we want parents to be able to work um, that being said, we place a lot of emphasis on teachers and educators in, in early childhood personnel and professionals in making that like investment actually produce those outcomes. And I don't think we've actually invested in the way that we need to. We've invested a lot of money thinking about 
um, making spots available, right? We also need to think about investing money into teacher compensation. We need to think about investing in the resources that children and educators might need access to. We need to think about making investments in state capacity, right? Our state leaders are doing incredible work. They are understaffed as well, right? Like we, we've had this expansion of early childhood without really this expansion of these other sections of our system. And so when Colorado and Arkansas talked about really emphasizing the adults and supporting the adults, it made a lot of sense to me. I think it aligned with the research that you found. And I think we can learn a lot from that. In particular, I, I think also about, we have this fragmented system in Vermont. Um, that means that those teachers have access to different professional development opportunities. That means that those teachers have access to um, or experience different requirements about what it takes to work in those settings. And so thinking about how we can support the early child workforce overall and help streamline some of those regulations. You know, if we know that it's important for a teacher to have a bachelor's degree and experience in early childhood, shouldn't all children get a teacher with a bachelor's degree, right? Like, don't we want that? So thinking about what it will take to to make this system work and to really prevent and maybe even do away with suspension and expulsion entirely uh, is a well-resourced, well-supported system with well-compensated and well-qualified teachers. Uh, so yeah, I would say that Arkansas and Colorado, just the philosophy at which they brought to it, um, that really was evident in all the policies and things that they were doing. That's great. Um, and the phrase I've heard you uh, use the past is adult change models, right? That adults are kind of the drivers of these decisions. And um, I just want to add a little bit to what you shared that every time you, I hear you talk about these concepts, I'm reminded of, you know, one of the, the basic tools I was taught as I'm a social psychologist. Um, and so this comes from uh, child development literature, the idea of co-regulation, right? So my child is losing his cool because he isn't getting what he wants or for any number of reasons, right? Um, the best way to calm him down and meet his needs is if I'm calm myself and co-regulate with my child. And, you know, when teachers are in the classroom, um, you know, they're obviously not, you know, the, the parent to the child, but they are in a parent-like role, right? We're asking them to role model for children all these different things, you know, around socialization and interpersonal connection. And so um, and we, this child are having, you know, those experiences that are emotionally hard and leading to what we would call unexpected behaviors, you know, we're asking the teachers really to step in and co-regulate, but it just goes to your point, like they need to be in a place where they can be calm and yeah. feel well supported in order if we're going to make that ask of them. And the, the, that co-regulation also needs to happen with the parents, right? So those supports going from family and, you know, early care setting, like thinking about how you can have one professional or multiple telling you like one set of strategies. We're going to, this is our team and this is how we're gonna approach it. We're gonna give you, you know, here's how to become a little less reactive. Here's how to, you know, do this. Like what a great opportunity to help support that child. And I, I just wanna say uh, one of the tensions that's present in early childhood um, uh, education is, you know, you said uh, in many ways that the educators are almost acting like parents. Uh, yeah, in a lot of cases for a lot of children in America, those ch children's waking hours are spent with adults outside of their home, right? That's the reality for a lot of children in America. And so- Their days are long, right? Like if I'm working nine to five and I have a commute, you know, pre-pandemic, <laughs> uh, I, I would be dropping off my kids at um, their early childhood center as early as 7.30 in the morning. I know people that they needed- you know, support and, and child care as early as 6 a.m., right? And then I got, you know, I'm picking them up 5.30 or 6 o'clock at night. So their day is actually 
quicker than my day. And you work a traditional day, right? What we might yes. call day. There's also a whole segment of early care that actually meets parents' needs for working overnight shifts. Right. right? Exactly. Yeah. So it's, oh, this, we, everybody needs support, but this system needs a little bit more support to get it where we want it to go. Yeah. Great. So um, I'm going to move us into our last question. If we could talk pie in the sky, ha, love the pun. What would you love the pun? happen as a result of this study? I would like everyone to have a deeper understanding of how policies affect children and families. I think policies can be wonderful. Uh, I love policy, uh, but thinking about how it actually gets implemented. How does it get interpreted? How does it get supported and resourced? And how is it experienced? And that idea that early childhood education plays a, such an important role in a child's life that we need in the functioning of our society, as you have said, you know, now and in the future, uh, when we think about like the positive societal returns that are expected, um, we need more data. We need researchers to look at this policy implementation, what is working for which children, you know, you could take a certain lens and, you know, really come up with different, understandings of how a policy is working, right? If you're just saying, hey, we invested money, these are the child outcomes on their third grade test score, right? You get one slice of understanding. But if you actually start looking at what's happening, are all families experiencing that same quality? Are they all experiencing access? You know, um, then, then all of a sudden you start to realize the different perspectives that got missed in that original study, right? Uh, and I think that's something that I really took away from this work. I think especially that idea that our, we've talked a lot in the past few years as a country about how our, our systems are oppressive, they're racist, they are designed to keep, you know, to maintain and sustain privilege. And that idea that if we want to disrupt and dismantle those so that we can actually have an equitable system, then we need to look at the people that didn't make it through the door or the children that didn't get to stay in those care situations. And so my takeaway, I would want people to be thinking about, yeah, let's invest in the workforce and supporting you know, children. And then also, wow, these policies really matter and how they're implemented really matter. So we also need to invest in getting more data and getting more research. Uh, one of the points that I don't think I made earlier when we were talking about our recommendation for a data system. The other states that I spoke to, they, they really talked about how difficult it is to get access to data. Because if you're a pre-K in an elementary school and the state says to you, you know, please report your suspension and expulsion numbers. First of all, you, know, you need to have a clear definition, but it is likely that you already have access to whatever that system to report those numbers is because you're part of the elementary public school system. If you're in a family child care center, how do you get access to that system? How do you report your numbers? Like, are you putting it on a paper airplane and flying it? Like, are you emailing it? Who are you emailing it to? Um, what incentive do you have to do so? So the data matters and we need better data and more research. Absolutely. And I just want to go back to um, the piece you're raising about equity, because I do think there are so many equity issues that are part of this conversation. So I just want to take a moment to name that, you know, my limited understanding of the history of early education and childcare is that one of the reasons people in those fields are undercompensated is because it's quote women's work, right? Yes. It's a field that women gravitate to because uh, you know, stereotypically, you know, women are seen as nurturers, not in, you know, I thought about going and, and becoming a teacher, right? Um, because I do like being around kids, but it has nothing to do with my gender. It's about who I am as a person, right? So, you know, but this idea that, oh, well, and then you get into, you know, some of the other, you know, um, isms, right? Heterosexism. And so the idea that, oh, well, 
a woman, she's probably married to a man, the man's the primary breadwinner, so she can, quote, afford to make less money because she's not the one that the family's relying on. This is like secondary income. And that's that's just like, A, unfair, and, and B, that's part of the dismantling of the system that, you know, we're currently in the throes of, um, you know. And, and, and I think another, yeah, you said kind of, you're, you're hinting that women are born with an innate caretaking skill set. You know, we come in knowing how to do it. Uh, I think ask anyone with a newborn baby and they'll tell you that is not the case. Uh, but that idea that it might not be something that people associate with needing specific training for. And that's the other part that we're trying to say, like, no, actually you do. You need to understand child development. You need to understand how to build a curriculum. You need to, and, and that just gets to another part of equity in the system and thinking about, okay, we want teachers to have bachelor's degrees, which is something we've already committed to in the K-12 system, right? We know that it's associated with outcomes. That's what we want. How are we going to get our workforce enrolled in programs that work for them, support them to pursue their, you know, advancing their education if they don't have it or getting the training they need. There are equity issues built in almost every part of this system. And I think our, our, our quality improvement project hits like right in the middle. And it kind of sh shows, yeah, there's a lot of things that need attention, but the great news is if you invest here and invest here and invest here, everything will start to get better. And then you can invest over, you know, like there are these, I see it as very hopeful. Uh, so I'm hopeful. I am too, especially given, um, you know, some of the recent uh, moves that have been made regarding policy in Vermont. Um, I'll say from my perspective, if I'm thinking, you know, what would I like to see happen as a result of this study? Um, you know, one of the points I uh, alluded to earlier, but I'll make it more clearly now is um, for me, this issue as a working parent, so that's the hat that I'm wearing right now of a child with a special health need, um, this sits at uh, a child with a special health needs right to a free and appropriate education and a parent's right to work, right? I said earlier, like, working or not, it should be a choice. It should be something that because of, you know, a flawed system, like that choice is taken away from you. So when I think about that, so this, you know, these systems have been at the societal level our, our answer to that question. Um, if a single parent wants to work or, you know, a dual parent scenario, they both want to work. So we, we've created these early um, education and childcare systems. So in order to, you know, center the equity of those uh, two groups of people where their needs overlap and intersect, um, then we need a system where every child care and early educator specialist feels like they have the confidence, knowledge, and support they need to care for a young child with any kind of special health need. So that's the system I want to see us building towards too. And that's when we'll know we have a system that's truly inclusive. I agree with you. Kudos. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Dr. Northey. A shout out to our colleague, Dr. Lori Meyer. Um, and as we said, this is an exciting time. So hopefully more to come in this area uh, based on uh, hopefully some joint additional joint research together. Yes, I hope so. And if people are wanting to make a difference, Vermont is a state where, you know, our legislature right now really would love to hear from you, you know, contact your elected officials and tell them that this matters to you. And Let's Grow Kids has a great platform for doing that. You can go to their dashboard. Fabulous.